Hey there, this is Mike and you're listening to Feeling Twisty. I'm really glad you're here. Back in the summer of 1985, I was a few months shy of my 15th birthday. My dad and I were at our house out in the country. We had two houses at the time. And we went to leave that house to head back to our newer home in the city. And my dad handed me the keys. Do you want me to drive? I asked. <laughs> yep, he said. So I did. I was nervous, but I was excited for the chance. Back then we could get our license, our driver's licenses at 15 years old. So any practice I could get was appreciated. I made it all the way back to the house in the city. And as I pulled into the carport, I accidentally hit the gas pedal instead of the brake and rammed my dad's brand new Dodge Caravan into a table. And that table went through the wall of the carport. <laughs> oh, my dad reached over and put the van in park. I got out of the driver's seat as quickly as I could and ran to my bedroom, locked the door and hid under the covers. And my dad didn't, didn't punish me or even yell at me. He even treated me to a movie, The Goonies, that night. I ended up getting my driver's license later that year. Now, about a year later, <laughs> I totaled my sister's Honda Prelude, slamming into the back of a pickup truck. And I had another dozen or so accidents <laughs> over the next decade. I wasn't a very attentive driver back then, and that was way before mobile phones. But I didn't give up on being a licensed driver. I saw a sort of freedom in having a driver's license, so I didn't give up. There was value in it for me, something worth it. Now jump ahead to my first day as the afternoon anchor at a local radio station. I had been a field reporter for only a couple of months. I had never been on a live microphone before, but the afternoon anchor called in sick and I was the only one in the studio. It's what I wanted but it came a lot faster than I expected. My news director, uh, he wasn't thrilled. He had repeatedly told me I wasn't good enough to be an anchor. He didn't even want me to be a reporter for him. But here I am delivering the news to the listeners in Southwest Louisiana and Southeast Texas from what was then the most powerful FM station in the area. And it was awful. Oh man, my mouth lost all of its moisture. My tongue felt like sandpaper. At one point, my throat contracted mid-sentence, causing the, the strangest noise to come out of my mouth. I kept going, though. As I read the news, I was telling myself no one heard that. But I looked up, and in front of me, the DJ was watching with a wide-eyed, what the hell is he doing look from his studio. <laughs> I made plenty of other mistakes as a reporter over the years. There was a swearing-in ceremony for a district court judge, and I was running late and missed the actual ceremony. I was able to snag the newly sworn-in judge for an interview during what was a strangely quiet reception following the ceremony. The whole thing, the reception and my interview with the judge, was awkward. I wasn't sure why at the time. It wasn't until I finished the interview that I found out why it was so awkward. He wasn't sworn in. Just before it started, his opponent in the election showed up with a lawyer contesting the results and demanding a recount. <laughs> that was embarrassing. But even though that was a very embarrassing moment for me, I didn't think about giving up being a reporter. It was still worth it to me. There was still value in it for me. There was value in persisting in what I wanted, in what I was being. It was worth it to me to continue in spite of the mistakes I made. <laughs> now fast forward nearly two decades to the day I found Neville on YouTube. Here's this man telling me that imagining creates reality and that all I need to do is assume the feeling of a wish fulfilled and it will be expressed in my world. He's telling me that I can radically change my life through my own wonderful human imagination. 
and that the God that I thought was out there somewhere, a God that was going to send me to hell if I didn't say the right prayer, is actually within me. And its nature is love. And he said that I can find redemption from all the unlovely things I thought defined me and actually change my life and the lives of my loved ones by a change in my imagination. In his lecture, God and I are one, he says, I'm going to tell you, you really are God. Your own wonderful consciousness, your human imagination, that is the God of Scripture, and there is no other God. Mind blown. <laughs> it lit a fire within me. It rang true from the very first lecture I heard. So I set about exploring this secret of imagining, this power, and this love. You might have heard the story of my healing, but there have been plenty of times after the healing where I failed in getting the desired results. I saw them as failures. That's how I defined them. But I didn't give up. Okay, I did think about giving up. <laughs> Boy, did I. There came a day a few years ago that I'd had enough. I had gotten so sick of what I saw as my many failures. So frustrated. I locked myself in my bedroom and I had it out with myself. There was some cursing, some screaming. At one point, I was crying my eyes out in the fetal position on the floor. <laughs> I had been holding on to months, months of frustration over what I judged as screw-ups in the use of my imagination, in what Neville calls the law of assumption. I knew that day I was either going to give up on all of this on what Neville taught, throw it all in the bin, or commit completely to living by imagination. After my tantrum, I got quiet and thought about all of it, asking myself, is there any value in this? Is this worth it? And after reminding myself of the successes, I decided, yes, there is something here, something worth exploring more deeply, something worth committing to. So that day, I did it. I committed to living by imagination, trusting imagination. I'd love to tell you it's been, you know, all wins ever since that day. <laughs> it hasn't, heck no. But I know now that there is only one cause. I cannot manifest anything outside of what I am allowing in imagination. Manifest means to demonstrate. It means be evidence of prove. So I am always demonstrating in my world what I am imagining. My life and my world, my circumstances, are proof of my state of consciousness. I can't turn to anyone else and lay the blame on them. Hey, Neville wasn't perfect either. He says in his radio talk, The Law of Assumption, my own failures would convict me were I to imply that I have completely mastered the control of my attention. And one of his late lectures, 1971 lecture, The Secret of Imagination, he says, can I dare to imagine that I am what I want to be? Well, I can. I've done it unnumbered times. I've done it successfully for many that I love dearly and many that I do not know. I have failed often too, but the failure is in me. It is not in the law. In spite of my failures, I saw the value in exploring imagination, the law of assumption, and the promise. So it isn't about just sharing my successes and those of others with you. It's, it's about the willingness to turn to imagination, to buy the pearl of great price. In my last episode, I shared a story from a woman in Pakistan who desired to see her country's team win the Cricket World Cup. In her story, you heard how her team did win games that they shouldn't have, but someone was quick to point out to me that Pakistan did not ultimately win the World Cup this year. And this person asked me a very good question. What's the point of turning within if you don't get the desired results? And this episode is my way of answering him. Now, I'm not a teacher. 
nor am I a coach. I have no desire for that. I'll never tell you what to do or that you have to do something or what to believe. But if you're listening to this podcast, then there's something in you that sees some value in exploring all of this. The woman who shared her story with me hasn't reached out to me again, but if she's listening, revise it. Revise the outcome. Don't give up. Don't give up thinking it was a failure. Not at all. Imagination isn't a little tool or trick to get what we want. It's who we are. God and imagination are synonymous. It's our very nature. And we're always experiencing the evidence, the proof of our imaginings. From Neville's 1967 lecture, The Cup of Experience, he says, we are here in this world of experience for a divine purpose, to know imagination, to know ourselves. So if that's our purpose, to remember that in spite of all the horrors of the world, we are one and we will awaken to or remember that our true nature is love. It's worth the seeming failures. That's why I do all of this. That's why I do feeling twisty. It's love. One day, also a few years ago, I was wondering about love. Neville says repeatedly that God is love and that we are love. And the writer of the New Testament book, First John, says that God is love. And anyone that loves is born of God and knows God. Well, who hasn't loved or felt love for someone or something? There you go. That is each and every one of us. But I wanted to really explore love. I know I love Kim and I love my kids and my family, but I also love Star Wars and Star Trek and I love the Beatles. So that day I got comfortable on my bed closed my eyes and dwelled on love. I just put the question to myself, the inner self, what is love? What does love feel like? And I waited. It didn't take too long. What I saw and felt was something that was uh, something completely different than anything I'd ever experienced. I want to say I was in emptiness, but Mike wasn't even there. It was just emptiness. I was aware of emptiness. I wasn't even aware of being Mike at the moment. Just an awareness of nothingness, no thing in particular. Then everything lit up. The black emptiness became this glowing opalescent light. It seemed to have a substance to it and it moved and shimmered. In front of me, coming from this light, were many beings moving toward me. But as they got closer, they, they merged from the many down to just a few, then to just one being. And that being was right in front of me, made of the same opalescence that surrounded me. It moved so close to me, I, I couldn't even see it any longer. I just felt it. I felt its presence and I felt unconditional love. For the very first time, unconditional love. Every unlovely thing that I thought defined me fell away. Everything, everything fell away. Everything that I thought was important to me <laughs> was gone. And all that was left was love. A love that didn't require anything, just acceptance. No church, no altar required, no specific prayer or phrase, no penance, just acceptance of this gift of love that was never separate from me. I don't know how long it lasted being there in the presence of this unconditional love. 
It seemed like I had always been there. But then the light started dimming. And I said to the one with me, I don't want you to leave. And it laughed, a gentle laugh, and said, I can never leave you. I'm always with you. I am in you. I am you. I love you. Love, unconditional love, unending, infinite love. That's why I do this. That's the point of all this for me. And this same love is within you. It is you and can never leave you. I love you. I'm feeling twisty.